is all about movement, by the way. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to say that quotation once more. So again, on the most basic level, we see the paintings. But if we suspend the experience at our visual receptors, we have not really seen. So think about that. If we suspend the experience at our visual receptors, we have not really seen. And Mark Rothko's son was talking about the emotional power of artwork, the power of a work to move us. And I want to focus on this idea of being moved, of movement. Okay. That art can move us emotionally and intellectually is something that we're, it's an idea that we're familiar with. But what about artwork that can move us physically? Try this. I want you all, and I'm going to try not to bump this mic, place your hands on your heads like this and your thumbs just hook them underneath here, right behind that ridge at the bottom of your skull, okay? You're right on top of your sub-occipital muscles. And this is what I want you to do. Move your eyes back and forth to the extreme, and then up and down, and all around. Can you feel that movement back then? The movement of, uh, of your eyes in the muscles in the back of your head? You can, even if you close your eyes, close your eyes and do it. Even when your eyes are closed, your body, your body's movement is connected to your eyes. This is really an amazing thing. You can try to move your eyes without your sub-occipital mu muscles moving. And it's impossible. You, you actually cannot physically do it. And why is this? Because as babies, we were born unlike other animals who could get up and move and walk within minutes or hours. We had to learn to move just like we had to learn to see. Learning to see is something that I talk a lot about in the color theory workshops that I run. Um, did you know that children at the age of five or six, they're still learning how to see? Facial recognition is an incredibly complex skill that I can look at Madison across the room and at this distance in this light tell by the shadow on the corner of her eye that she's amused by what I'm saying and not angry. That's an incredibly refined skill. It's actually quite amazing when you break it down like that. And it's something that we're not born with. We have to learn it. We have to learn it just like we have to learn to move. And did you know that experiments have been done with, with kittens? Um, they're deprived of movement from day one through their early developmental stages. And these kittens actually grow up functionally blind. They never learned how to connect the movement of their bodies with what they were seeing. And they can't function. See, as an infant, we learn to move our eyes to search and to find the source of mom's voice. And when we do this, the muscles of our sub-occipital, our sub-occipital muscles learn how to move with our eyes. And then as we develop, our spine muscles learn how to turn with the muscles in the back of our head. Pretty soon we learn how to reach out our arm, to, to reach up, to point, to grasp, legs to stand, to walk, all of this to get to mom or to get to what it is we're learning how to see. All this happens because we learn to move our eyes at the same time that we learn to move our bodies to follow our eyes. Our ability to see and to move, these abilities are inextric inextricably interwoven. Without movement, the kitten will be blind. And without movement and touch, an infant will die. There's, this is the medical term is failure to thrive, and it's a real thing. So this is actually really serious stuff, this idea that our bodies are designed to move in order to understand the world around us. The job of your sub-occipital muscles from infancy to death is to keep your eyes on a level. And then to organize, communicate with all the other muscles in your body, to organize to get to get underneath your eyes to sustain that level. They're amazing little muscles. They're no bigger than the tip of your pinky, those eight little muscles. 
they are truly the eyes in the back of your head. Are you using them? Are you being moved by what you see? Kinesthetic intelligence is a concept I was introduced to a little over a year ago, and it's something that I've been captivated by, and it's something that's directed my work ever since. The human body is intelligent. We have a felt sense that is our kinesthetic, proprioceptive, spatial sense of orientation and movement. That's a mouthful. But it's what, it, it helps us to know who we are and how to move in the world around us in a way that our brain simply cannot do. <laughs> Come on in. Hi. Hello. It is unlike the special senses that are rooted in the eye, the nose, the mouth, the ear, the tongue. It, it is body-wide. It is our skin, our muscles, our skeleton, our fascia. It is the intelligence behind the experience, the embodied experience of being alive. You see, I grew up camping, hiking, playing sports, lots of sports. I didn't grow up going to galleries and museums. I grew up with art, yes, because my mom is an artist, but she was also very active as I was growing up, and she still is. So is my dad. Um, so I grew up with these two ways of being in the world, the artist and the athlete. And I always sort of understood that these were two very separate things. Um, it was always a choice you know, to do art or to do the athletics. And when I went to the Cooper Union, my athletic endeavors were largely ignored by the art department. Um, but Cooper wasn't just art. It was architecture and engineering as well. And it was a small school, still small, but it was D3. And so it had a ragtag assortment of sports teams. It had a men's basketball team, but not a women's basketball team. And this was a little bit of a problem for me because at that time, basketball was my thing. And uh, so I tried out for the men's basketball team. And I made it. And I played all four years. Um, I think the art department was always a little embarrassed by this. <laughs> and, uh, but my freshman year, I wasn't the only artist on the team. The other artist was Colin Page, which I'm sure many of you know his work. I think it's on display upstairs. You can take a look afterwards. And I know some of you also know that Colin is six foot seven inches. Okay, so I had never played against a six foot seven inch high school girl. And getting my shots blocked by Colin Page was quite the kinesthetic education. It was rough. It was really rough. Um, Colin is still a very large figure in my life. I have, I, I just, I love and appreciate the work that he does and uh, have learned so much from him in conversation. Um, but let me get back to uh, art school and athletics, a marriage that was, uh, in my experience, an unhappy one. And it was about as awkward as trying to be a landscape painter at a super progressive art school in New York City. That I came from the land of the Wyeths and that I was very proud of it was not something that my professors were very happy about. So when I graduated from school, I returned to Maine in order to paint the landscape, my most loved subject, in peace. But a funny thing happened. I really struggled. I had no peace. There was just this constant sense of fidgety distraction. I would stand there in front of my easel, my easel in front of this beautiful scene, and it's, I just couldn't stand still. Yes, I had been moved by this, this beautiful place to paint, but I felt moved to hike through it and bike through it and swim through it more. So my strategy became sequestering myself inside to contain my energy. I started painting landscapes as seen through windows. And that's actually the first work that I exhibited here at Courthouse was a series of these windows where the, the inside and the outside sort of shimmered back and forth between each other. I loved these window paintings when I was making them, and I still do. But it's funny. I look back now and I see the window panes a little bit more like prison bars. Beautiful prison bars, for sure, but prison bars nonetheless. 
They contained me. They kept me from moving in the direction that my eye was trying to lead me. After college, I got into triathlon, and through triathlon, I got into long distance open water swimming. Love, loved, loved, still love being in the water. Uh, swimming a mile, two miles, three miles, six miles. I've done some really long swims, and some really silly swims, but great swims. I loved being in the water. And any of you who know the sensation of jumping in the lakes and the rivers of Maine, you know it can become an addiction. Um, so I joined this group of women who would go out three times a week and swim early in the morning in the Gunnifer Lake. And we'd go out along the shore for half a mile and then come back a half a mile. And there was always this moment when we were coming back and I would be, whenever I would take a breath on my left hand side, you could look up and, and first of all, you're, you know, you're, eye is right there at the surface of the water and you can sort of see the and feel that muffled murkiness down below you um, but at the very same time you know you you would look up and you could catch the the light the sunlight rising over the ridge of the Camden Hills and starting to glint across the water and catch the swimmers arms next to you and the splashes and just like that whole diamond effect and then the confetti effect of the you know, the dots, the sprinkles of, of colorful swimmer caps and just such an amazing experience. And the feeling of it and the visual sensation of it was, <gasps> that was what it felt like. That's what it looked like to me. Both the same, that same sensation. And so I love this and I wanted to figure out a way to paint it. I'm still trying to figure out a way to paint it. And so one day, this is what I did. I brought a waterproof camera with me. And from that day on, my whole world as a visual artist changed. Forget standing in front of an easel and forget everything that I'd been told. My new swim buddy was my Olympus Tough crash proof and waterproof camera. And what it did is it allowed me to step windows and into my own paintings. In a sense, I became my paintings. They still are made in my body first and then in paint. And that's why I say I load my, bo I load my body with movement just like I load my brush with paint. It's like, you know, here, here I've got this delicious glop of exercise, beautiful, ready to go paint. And then on the other hand, here I've got this body, this miraculous system of cells and joints, and fulcrum points and power. And both, with both, it's all about action potential. What am I gonna do with that brush? What am I gonna do with this body, okay? So the artist and the athlete met. Kinesthetic intelligence became kinesthetic imagination. So I'm having these experiences swimming. And it's like I'm that infant looking for the voice. And I'm learning how to let the looking teach my body how to move and follow. My husband and I began to plan these adventures. We'd go snowboarding and paddle boarding and hiking and biking and rock climbing and surfing and you name it. We went, we saw, and I painted. I started to explore the broad concept of play. You know, the human body at play, this experience, this, again, kinesthetic seem so starved in our world anymore once we sort of strap kids into really restrictive school shoes and sit them at desks and tell them to stay still, listen, be quiet, don't move. This happens about the first graders. Can you hear me? Most of us are still these first graders, just trapped in adult bodies. Think about it. We sit when we go to work. We sit when we're in the car, when we're on a plane, 
We sit when we eat meals and go to movies. We even sit when we go to the gym because most of the machines at the gym anymore are designed so that you can do, you know, your leg adductor exercises or your bicep curls while you're sitting. Okay. So there's this huge range of motion and movement capacity that's simply dead, dead and, and blind, sort of just like those kittens I mentioned earlier, because we sit so much and we don't move enough. It's not really incorporated in our daily lives. So here's the thing, unless we're in a hot tub, when we're in water, we don't really get to sit down, right? We get to bring our body into full extension and full flexion. We can circumduct our shoulder joints. We can move fast. We can move slow, right? And, and the best thing of all, there's privacy. Why do you think we love water aerobics so much in this country? It's a phenomenon. We're covered by the water surface. And there's this feeling that we can move in ways that we wouldn't otherwise dream of in our sitting lives. We're free and we're safe. And we can imagine and act out ways of being in our body that are new and creative, refreshing and restorative. Water is amazing like that. I just finished reading a book uh, written by, and you can correct me, I'm going to butcher this name, Diane Dinson Buckman. Don't know if anyone's heard of her, but her book, the complete, the complete book of water healing, and it's a super practical guide to um, taking care of whatever ailment might be uh, you might be experiencing at the time with just hot and cold water application. It's pretty amazing because water is amazing. We're mostly water. Yeah. So it makes sense that this element would be. More than any other type of water therapy, cold water and its various forms of showers and baths and compresses, and even just for drinking, can bring us back to ourselves with profound simplicity. A daily cold shower, it's no joke, is still the best way to tone your body and to enhance your immune system and your overall vitality. It's an amazing thing. And the coldest water that I've ever experienced was um, the painting there in the back, the large painting in the back. That's a rattlesnake pool. And that water, it's absolutely brain paralyzing frigid. Like it's, it's, it's unbelievable. On a 90 degree hot and humid day that um, we were hiking in the Evans Notch area in, in Western Maine, uh, the scream of vitality that went up through my body when I jumped in that water, there's no words really to, to describe it. Uh, just pure life. And uh, it was and is to this day probably one of my top 10 experiences that I've ever ever had. So if you ever have a chance to make it to Rattlesnake Pool and it's on a beautiful drive, Route 113 between Gilead, Maine and Freiburg, Maine, beautiful drive, wonderful hike in, um, you won't be disappointed. It's some of the most beautiful water, the colors and the clarity, just absolutely otherworldly. So Rattlesnake Pool was the second stop on a very specific series of adventures that my husband and I had planned and executed last summer. And it all began after discovering Frenchman's Hole. Has anyone ever been to Frenchman's Hole? Again, in Western Maine, in the Bethel area. Uh, spent a weekend in the Grafton Notch State Park area, which is where it is. Um, and after that, we decided to spend the rest of August and September jumping in as many main streams as we could before fall set in. So it was like, became really urgent because it was sort of already the middle of August. Um, so this is what we were doing last, last, uh, at the end of last summer. And you see, so although my love of swimming was many summers deep at that point, that was new and different. 
For the very first time, I not only felt the desire to paint my swimming experience, but I also felt the sensation of a painting fully formed in my body before I made it. I could feel the paintings I was going to make as I swam. You know, that sounds strange. And I'm not quite sure how to describe this, except that when I say that my paintings are made in my body before they're made in paint, this is what I mean. I know exactly the what and the how of the painting. And then it just comes down to getting home and letting it come out. Letting that painting come out. The big movements of my body, traveling through the smaller movements of my arm, my hand, and my fingers. You see, I didn't, this is a weird thing to say, but I didn't really struggle with the paintings that are in this show. Um, but any struggle I experienced in the studio was the result of forgetting what a certain experience felt like in my body and how I felt. You good? In the water, I am playful. I imagine and float, bubble, flail. Fiddle with the mic. Is that okay? And back in the studio, I make the same exact movements, just on a smaller scale. Instead of a swimming hole, I have a wood panel to play in. Float, bubble, flail, sometimes come very close to drowning. Like I said, there are those few paintings. In the water, it's all about making shapes with my body. In the studio, it's all about making best piece of painting advice I was ever given were words from Charles Hawthorne's book on painting. Some of you may know it. He said that painting is beautifully simple. All we have to do is get the color spots in right relationship. And I talk a lot about these color spots in my color workshops. I always uh, bring up the difficulty of painting, say, an ear. Everybody gets their undies in a bundle about painting an ear, right? Or a hand, or a nose, those small details, a tree, a cloud even. But to a painter, it's all the same. I tell the students, don't focus on how you think an ear should look in a painting. When we do this, we're measuring all the ears we've ever seen in our brain. And we're thinking way too much about how to paint the ear right, okay? We're thinking so much we don't even see the living, breathing ear that's in front of us, which again, for our purposes as a painter, is just like anything else. It's just spots of color in right relationship. Remember, it's beautifully simple. And frankly, it's the same way when it comes to living our daily lives. We do so much thinking. Our brains are constantly going. Constant chatter, mile a minute. I know this because this is my brain, and I know I'm not unlike most people. Our brains are getting in the way of living our lives a lot of time. We think instead of feel. We think instead of move. You know those gut feelings that you have? Move. We've let IQ or intellectual intelligence dominate our conversation about human capacity. Only recently have we started to acknowledge EQ or emotional intelligence. I'm sure some of you have read about that. And KQ, kinesthetic intelligence, is even newer to the scene, although it's a very old concept. We're so stuck on the idea of IQ as this pinnacle that it's actually become visually obvious uh, how overburdened our bodies are by our brain. You know, our brain weighs 10 to 12 pounds when it's perfectly balanced atop our, 
our spines, but how many of us are maybe walking around a little bit more like this? Huh? Right? Myself included. I've been trying to work on that posture thing. It's, it's, it's true. It's real. Um, our spines, see, were designed with these beautifully supportive curves that can take that 10 to 12 pound weight and cradle it and cushion it as we move. However, most of us sit and we collapse over our computers and we collapse over our tablets and we really collapse over those phones. I mean, how many of us are like this with our phones, you know? This is the information age. And for every inch that our heads are moved in front, held in front of our shoulders, we gain 10 pounds. So, you know, right here, you've got the 10 to 12 pound head. Just this slight movement here, you've got a 20 pound, 30 pound, 40 pound, and that's right, most of us. And 40 pound heads. And we wonder why chronic neck and back pain is at such an epidemic level right now. Do you know it costs our country, chronic neck and back pain costs our country $635 billion a year. That's more than cancer, heart disease, strokes, and diabetes combined. How we move is important. Most of us are walking around with those heavy heads, like I said, and when we're always hurting and in pain, because that's what, it, it's just so much stress on our body. As a result, we're more depressed, more agitated, less likely to go out and see friends. We don't sleep as well, and we're way less creative. Between tech neck, which is sort of what that thing's called, it's a natural phenomenon, and sleeping, which many of you may have heard by now, is the new smoking. Don't worry, get out of these chairs soon. <laughs> Um, we must know, you know, we must feel it in our bodies. Something isn't right. Something isn't right. And one of the reasons that I make the work that I do is to help restore rightness, to restore a right relationship with our bodies through movement, to restore our body's relationship in which it moves because it was designed to move. Everything about your joints and your muscles points you to movement. The sub-occipital muscles are not just for infants, they're for us. Movement keeps us dead spots, stagnant spots. So just like with water, don't drink from a stagnant pool. Moving water is health. Movement keeps us in relationship it's dynamic balance and alignment. Movement is living, breathing beauty. And just as we can be moved, we ourselves then can move in and by this beauty. And so my challenge to you is, you know, whether you consider yourself an artist or not, to feel that is you. Go ahead, look at these paintings and feel these paintings in you but then feel the painting that is you. How do you do this? Well, have you ever heard of mirror neurons? Mirror as in a mirror on a wall, mirror neurons. Anyone? Oh good, but oh, this is fun. <laughs> so mirror neurons are the way that we've learned to do just about everything. Uh, you can use them now to learn. So when you were a child, in order to figure out how to pick up a cup, you watched the people around you. You watched your parents, you watched your siblings. And when you saw them pick up a cup, this certain set of, of neurons would fire in your brain. And then when you yourself finally reached out and picked up that cup and figured out that series of movements and, and actions that you needed to take to do that, the same set of neurons fired. These were your mirror neurons. They mirror the actions that you see being performed and then map them in your brain as if you yourself were the one acting. To your brain, there is no difference between seeing someone swim, whether it's in real life, in a movie, in a photo, 
or even in a painting, there's no difference between seeing someone painting and you yourself painting. To your brain, there is no difference. This is a fairly recent discovery, this mirror neuron phenomenon, and it's why visualization has become such a strong tool for athletes, for anyone really, anyone. And this, this is why I make the paintings that I do with people in them. A landscape painting with a figure, with someone just like you and me in it, will produce this mirroring effect because mirror neurons only fire when an action is embodied, okay? And so although we might love our traditional, pure, pristine landscape paintings and find them beautiful and transcendent, and they are, okay? Although they might move us spiritually and intellectually, and they do, and although our head and neck muscles will move to follow our gaze, which is rightly captured by them, because I love landscape paintings just as much as the next person. Although all of these things still, these paintings without figures, without embodied action, they cannot produce the same effect. They cannot educate our bodies in just one glance. As an artist, to understand that what I paint can implicate someone else in an activity, well, that's a very powerful thing. And so I, that's one of the reasons that I feel like it's so desperately important in this time of misalignment, whether we're talking about spines or body images or the experience of nature and where we fit in creation, I think it's really important to make images that show us ourselves, that show us in right relationship within our bodies, moving, moving in freedom and health, that show us in right relationship with the natural world around us, in curiosity, discovery, play, a sense of play, and that show us in right relationship to beauty, in wonder and delight, I believe in beauty. I believe in the power of beholding and becoming. It is important what we see. It is very important. You know, all the systems of our body need food, not just our stomachs. Our eyes need food, our noses need food, our, our tongues need food, our ears need food. Be beautiful music is food for our ears and our brain. What are we feeding our sense of sight? What are we feeding our eyes, our vision? It is important because what we see, what we see affects our whole body. It has the power to move us, for better or for worse. Listen, I'm just like you in this world. I'm trying to figure out how to do the work that I'm called to do and to be of good service. And I make mistakes. I'm trying to figure out how to matter, maybe. Is that what I'm trying to figure out? I don't know. Um, I think worrying about whether I matter is maybe letting the brain get involved a little too much. Joseph Campbell has this thing that he says that um, he says that people think that what we're seeking is meaning in life. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what we're really seeking. I don't think so. I think what we're seeking is the experience of being alive. It's a very different thing. These paintings are my best attempts so far to communicate my experience of being alive. I have a long way to go yet. To be a more effective communicator with paint, to be a more effective expressor with the movements that I embody, but I'm getting there. I feel I'm on to something and I'm inviting you to come with me. My great hope, my greatest desire is that my paintings extend beyond me. Sort of like the arms of this swimmer here. You know that feeling when you're in the water? 
that you're limitless, like that surface that just goes out from you. I would love for my paintings to stir a desire in others, in you, to move, to experience, experience, to explore movement. Stop overthinking it. Get out of your brain and into your body. Get out of these chairs. You, we've all been, you know, you've been sitting too long. I've probably been talking too much at this point. Um, we must remember it's, it's beautifully simple, really. Touch these paintings with your eyes, be moved, and go dive in. That's what I have to say.